Good afternoon, I am Pete, also known as Risk for Rewards. We're over on Twitter, at Risk for Rewards. Currently got around just over 17,000 followers over there. And here on YouTube, we're coming up to about 1,300 mark. So if you're not subscribed, and if you'd like to subscribe down at the bottom, it means that you'll get my notifications as soon as I upload a video like this one. Because I don't always tweet them. I'll probably end up tweeting this one this evening when I get a chance. So you'll get them first before anyone else has seen them. Um, and if you enjoy the videos, then please feel free to comment and a like at the bottom is uh, always much appreciated. So we are on video four of five. So video four is, of course, Friday of the Cheltenham Festival review. As I've said in the last three videos, I'm going to keep the sentiment out and tell everyone how lovely it was, and how nice it was, because most people have already watched it, seen the replays a million times. They were either there or they saw much better coverage than me describing it um, on things like ITV Racing. So therefore, I'm just going to keep it quite short and sweet and um, just point out where I think horses may go, what I think they may do, and what I think they might achieve in the next two festivals. So obviously, Aintree and Punchtown. Um, Aintree is two weeks tomorrow and Punchestown is uh, 10 days after it. So there's not much of a gap between those two, but there has been between there and Cheltenham, which has been quite nice to have a gap, to be honest, after Cheltenham. So it's brilliant, but you need a little bit of a refresher. So anyway, let's get straight to it and on to the number four, day four, and we are Friday. So we are the JCB Triumph Hurdle was the first race of the day. So as I've said previously, I have got, a, I will review all of my anti-post selections on video five, which will be coming up after this. So I'm not going to talk through about uh, the process and the horses that we've backed. Um, so obviously Lossy Mouth. Uh, was a bit of a coin toss for many, uh, Lossy Mouth or Blood Destiny. They were both around 2-1 to one the night before, Wednesday, Thursday, and then the money came for Lossy Mouth late on. Um, Lossy Mouth obviously was one of my anti-post selections that did go in at 16-1, to one. so it was a brilliant start after a woeful Thursday. Um, so just going through the race, I'm going to start from the back. Obviously, Blood Destiny didn't really run a race at all. Um, whilst I had Blood Destiny and Lossy Mouth fairly close together with their French form, um, I did mention that Blood Destiny had done a lot of his running with the Boodles horses rather than the Triumph horses. So he wasn't running in the graded races. Willie was putting him in um, separate races and racing against Boodles horses, so he could have been flattered. At the same time, I don't think this was his running whatsoever. I did, he didn't look like he was travelling. I think if you were on Lossy Mouth, you were pretty pleased with how Blood Destiny was travelling. But he just was free... And it just looked like he hadn't really had a race of that sort of level. I'd just be happy to just put your lungs, run straight through it and uh, judge him next time when he comes out. It wouldn't surprise me if he comes out at Punchestown or even at Aintree and he just bolts up in whatever race he, he runs in. Because I'd still say, in my opinion, I still think he's probably in the top four or five juveniles. Um, he could still be the best, but for whatever reason, he didn't fire on the day. Um uh, Gust of Wind ran well. Obviously, just bearing in mind, Willie Mullins did have the first four in this race. Um, Gust of Wind ran well into fourth. Um, seems to be a horse that is okay, like as in, and it could end up having a very similar profile to what um, Ilite Thompson did, where places this year um, and then comes back as a novice next year. Um, Zenta, I did flag this one up as a, a big runner. Uh, I think it was about 25 to 1. I said that I wasn't sure if it would come into the uh, the first three. I did expect it to go well, though, and I thought she'd be one for your trackers for another day. She actually ran a lot better than I thought she did. At one stage, I thought she might even push Lossy Mouth the whole way, and I definitely thought she was booked for second as well at one at, at one stage. Um, and she only got out-battled by Gala Masso, literally just jumping the last. So it would not surprise me if she comes out as one of the better four horses in this. And this current price of her, I think it's around 25 to 1 for the Mayor's Hurdle. Obviously, the issue is it is still a quite a big step up in um, in grades to go to the mare's hurdle class. Like she's around to a one three eight RPR there, and the mare's hurdle horses like horses like um, Marie's Rock, um, they run to RPRs of say one sixty. So that's like twenty pounds to find. Obviously, she is only a four year old, so there's plenty of time for her to do that, and she could just continue to Im uh, improve. Exact same rinse and repeat replies for Gallo Marceau. Already a Group 1 winner, having beaten Lossy Mouth. We can now see that clearly everyone who backed the Lossy Mouth in their accumulators would like their money back because I find it hard to see how Gallo Marceau would have beaten Lossy Mouth had she not been so unlucky. But all the same, Gallo Marceau is clearly a, a very useful type. And again, she's another one. She strikes me as a horse that will never get to her full potential just because she remains keen still. 
Um, but at the same time, even without that, she's still running to really high numbers and running really well. So she's again, she'll be one at the Dublin Racing Festival, uh, Dublin Racing Fe- at the Punchtown Festival um, in three weeks' time um, to keep on your radar. And lost your mouth. What more can you say, really? She's talked the talk, walked the walk. She was a talking horse prior to the um, season starting. Started out, I think she was 33s to begin with. The first markets I saw were 20s, but I couldn't get on with those, so I didn't want to tell anyone. That's the way it works. I don't want to tell anyone until I could get on. And then um, once I was on, I was happy to share. So obviously, if, if I could get on at 20s, then I would have shared straight away at 20. So apologies for that. But it is what it is. We all got to make some some money somehow. Um, and that's still better than the 11 to 8 that she went off regardless. So a lot of people have mentioned her going forward, uh, backing her for things next year. Um, I've had people say, oh, she's definitely going to win the mayor's hurdle and stuff like that. I've got a few concerns. So. She was very, very free. She hadn't been seen too free. She was she was a strong traveller, um, but she wasn't too free, whereas she was quite free and quite gassy um, coming down the hill. And she was very, very like, a bit like Vorban last year. She was very behind the bridle, let's go. Um, travelled into the race beautifully. She did hung, hang slightly, but nothing that you'd worry about in the slightest. Um, and she won very well. But as I've just mentioned, like that puts her on a one four three RPR. So it's not beyond her, but she's still got to improve probably 10 to 15 pounds to be up there with the mare's hurdle types, um, the likes of like an Epitan. Obviously, again, she's only a four-year-old. Four My concern would be that the people who are saying, one, she's only five to one for the mare's hurdle, when the likes of Zenta's 25 to one and Gala Marceau, I think it was maybe 16 to one. Um, the other thing is as well, is the mare's hurdle is over two mile, four furlongs. So this was two mile, one furlong. So she is quite a strong travelling type is she really going to want that extra three furlongs? Obviously, Willie Mullins is the master, so they'll get another run out of her possibly um, uh, before the end of the season, probably another tick in the box, another victory. Um, but then he's got to decide whether he can settle her and whether it's going to improve her to be settled or whether she's a two-miler and the likes of the champion hurdle are going to be her option. Downside of that is obviously one year she'll get the weight allowance, but we've seen how good Vorban won Arguably, obviously, we don't know for sure yet, but Vorban won what looked on paper a very strong triumph uh, last year. And obviously, Pied Piper should have backed that up with a Group 1 winner, Aintree. Um, but obviously, since then, he's been found out well and truly, really, whether it's by age, experience, or he's just not improved as many would hope. Um, and he couldn't make that jump. So it's just worth bearing in mind if you're steaming in. I mean, if lost your mouth, if you were looking at it and she was like, say, 12s or 16s, then I'd be thinking, yeah, it might be worth the, the roll. But five to one for the mares. One, obviously, as I said, you've got to go up three furlongs. She's got to gain another 15, 20 pounds. I don't doubt the, the, the 15, 20 pounds. I think she could probably make that. Um, but it's the step up in trip. And also, will she even be campaigning that direction? If she goes to Champion Hurdle, then obviously that's going to be another step up again, even without Constitution Hill. She's still got to find, she'll have to find even more. So there's, there's plenty of question marks for me. I just wouldn't be one rushing in. And I've had plenty of people messaging me saying, lost your mouth for Champion Hurdle, lost your mouth for Mares. Like these Triumph horses, they do win really, really well. But I can tell you what, I'll just go to the past winners. It's always worth forgetting. In my early punting days, I used to fall for this every time until I started to to obviously learn and learn and learn like you've got Deffy de Sil on it in 2017 and he went on to then be a, a very good horse um going forwards over uh fences and he made it to group one level but then you've got horses as well on the other side of things like uh far class pentland hills is that horse have you even in, even won again since burning victory quilixios all these horses barely, barely struggling to win again, let alone win. So, and then obviously Vorban uh, last year. So Vorban would pick up some nice races over two miles, but at top level. And that's what you're looking at currently. You're looking at Cheltenham and the post markets for 2024. So for me personally, I wouldn't be steaming in. And if I was going to, I'd be interested in something like maybe like a Zenta at 25 to one, um, just in the thought that maybe they can get her settled. But again, you can sit on your hands and wait. Wait to see what they're entered in at Punchtown Festival and then say, oh, I think she'll win that. I want to back her for this prior. You don't have to rush out and bet now because the markets aren't really going to move until they get their entries for in the next few weeks. And of course, I'll be back on again to say, I'm going to back Zenta before she runs here. So, um, right then, on to the county. Oh. Obviously, I put Pembridge up at 16 to 1. Um, quite a bit before the festival, two or three weeks, uh, Pembridge, Pembroke. 
and just looked absolutely tailor-made. Skelton, Skelton's record in the race between him and Willie Mullins, he's took three of the last seven. Mullins obviously took three of the last seven and everything looked tailor-made. This, they laid him out, dropped back in trip, very lightly raced, went in under the radar. And everyone cottoned onto it a lot later and they end up going from 16 to 1 into 9 to 2. Um, the the problem was, for whatever reason, he just didn't run his race. He like he travelled well, but he made, a, he made a mistake at second last and he was given a very easy ride. It would not surprise me if this was a bit like Langer Dan last year where Langer Dan was, it was the Martin Pipe that he was in and he fell um, early on in the race. And then he went to Aintree and he proved that he was well handicapped by winning the Aintree in one of the big handicaps. Don't be surprised to see Pembroke turn up to one of these big handicaps um, and going very well there. Um, for whatever reason, he just didn't really fire on the day. Obviously, it could turn out that maybe he's not that well handicapped um, and he's not that great. Um, but I believe that there'll be more, especially the money that came for him. Um, obviously, Filey Bay ran an admirable race, admirable race, two and three quarter lengths off the winner. I would, for me personally, I'd say one, it was a bit of that crook, the fact that the um, whole, with the Betfair hurdle, they gave him the rise of the marks and it was up something like four pounds. And then a few days later, they're like, oh, we've put Auckland risk to this. So you need to go up another three or four pounds. Let's just have a look and see what it ended up running off. So yeah, ended up going off uh, eight, eight pounds higher, which I'm sure the original rise was four or five pounds. And obviously they didn't use a claimer either. They used Mark Walsh. So, I mean, I think there was ways that that horse could have won or gone a lot closer. Um, or obviously you could just say the Betfair hurdle was his day and he and he didn't take the chance. But ran a brilliant race, just bumped into a few better. Um, Pipe Piper, I thought, was the horse that should have won the race. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the ride. I just thought came there on the snaff. Everything was going right. Looked to be going on to win the race. Pecked, ridden out, but just didn't get ridden out hard enough. Um, I think a horse has only gone up three pounds, so could well obviously race at Aintree in that uh, juvenile race last year, could well end up there again um, this year. Um, not obviously in that same race, but at Aintree, so we know the track is going to suit a strong traveller in the handicaps, um, but we'll see. Uh, Favois, a skeleton horse, so obviously he enhanced his claims. Like, I should have seen this. Like I, I did see this. I did look at it. I'm not going to lie, it's nothing against the jockey. It was just obviously the jockey booking slightly put me off um, and all the money coming for the other one. And But I still should have, like, you shouldn't have took the chance. When you've got a trainer that's got that good, almost 50% strike rate in the race and they've only got two runners, then you just back both when, when the other ones. It would have been probably a 50 to one shot the day before. So it's foolish of me not to see this one, but it's one of those that just got away. And obviously Dan Skelton enhances his record. That's him now, um, four in the last eight. And um, Willie Mullins remains three in the last eight, with his best finisher being Charger in fourth. Uh, the Albert Barlett, very interesting race. Obviously, the favourite Corbett's Cross was coming to the last, was going to go into the battle um, and just bend himself straight through the side railings. Um, problem is with that is you never know how good that horse was. I think the horse could be, end up being the best of these. Obviously, had the beating of the rest of the field at the time, bar the winner, stay away Faye. Um, I don't think that the race three weeks ago over two miles would have helped in the slightest. So you could argue did very well under the prep. Um, and the thing is as well, on that day against Founder 50, even though it was over two miles, he found plenty off the bridle. So it's, it's not very easy to say Stay Away Faye was going to find more off the bridle than Corbett's Cross because they hadn't started asking the question yet. So I would keep Corbett's Cross in your tracker. I have had a look for him and he's 20 to 1 or I think he's about 16 to 1 for the Brown Advisory. Um, but some might say he needs to come back in trip. But I think they've bought this as a horse for three milers, Gold Cup and stuff. But Emmett Mullins is a very patient trainer. So I'm not sure how much you'll get out of him. And they've said he's been a bit quirky since he came there. So you might not see him before the end of the season. Therefore, if that's the case, then you don't have to worry about backing him until the start of next year. Because they, they'll probably have a um, trainer's column saying, this is where I'm aiming my horses. And he'll say... I'm aiming him at the Brown Advisory in, say, October, November time. And the last thing that you'll look at on form will be when he's gone through the railings at Cheltenham. So it's hard to, to uh, shorten a horse off that. So you can look at it much closer to the time. But I definitely wouldn't be writing him off. He, he is a horse of serious potential. And look at J.P. McManus's purchases this week. Impervious, winner. Dream to share, winner. And obviously this horse, it was if it wasn't going to win, it was going to come second. Um, 
plenty of hard luck stories in, in behind. As I've said, three card brag, I just think needs a bog and would always, it just seems to always find at least one or two better. I think it'd be a horse that'll always flatter to deceive, will be staying on. So it looks a bit like a national hunt chase sort of horse. Whether they'll go that direction, I don't know, or a grand national. Just I just think it's just slow, to be honest. Um, obviously, Sandro Clegane um, and Alfredel Fury both ran massive races and they were coming back to the winner on the line. Um, it's hard to know what to do with the winner because this race was, wasn't was ran at a fast, uh, a fast pace um, and the section will tell you that. But staying on at the end, he didn't quicken away from the rest. He just got slower, slower than the rest. That makes sense. He was slowing down slower than the others. So the others were going, um, and that's that's why he just saw it out. So he is obviously a very good high-class stayer. It's going to be interesting to see what they do come the um, Aintree Festival, because Nichols likes to run uh, one of his best in the uh, Sefton, which is a three-mile group one there. Um, and that's what he won last year with Giolino Bello, who obviously was second behind Blaze and Carl twice. So they it wouldn't surprise me if Stay Away Faye goes there and then meets the horse that finished second behind last time of McManus's, uh, McManus's of um, McCain's Maximilian for me I think this horse with the experience on the belt should have won that day against Maximilian I'd backed him that day and I think would reverse the form my concern would be like that was an absolute grueler of a finish like as in they were he was pushed along a long way it was a good ride um, so for me personally I mean <clears throat> he's one to have on your brown advisory radar for next year currently around 16 to 20s um, but will he win at Aintree after that four weeks later? It wouldn't surprise me if he flopped there and then you get a bigger price. But he's not even entered at the moment. There's plenty of Nichols horses, that the ones that haven't been kept fresh and have come here and ran brilliant races. Because normally they run average here and then they come on for Aintree. They've run really good races here and some of them I'd, I wouldn't want to see at Aintree, to be honest. And stay away Faye, I'd probably put in that category because I'm not sure you can back up that sort of performance four weeks later with such a young horse. But we'll see. So stay away, Faye and Corbett's Cross are my two to take out of that. Probably both going towards the Brown Advisory. Um, I think a stay away, Faye, more than likely, definitely will go towards the Brown Advisory. But obviously, I haven't placed a bet on either of those yet because we've got plenty of time for more information. On to the Gold Cup. And this was a race we've absolutely nailed all year, thankfully very much. Um, obviously, it took 13 months in the wait, in the making. I put up uh, Brave Man's Game to win the King George and Galloping Deschamps to win the Gold Cup here. I myself got 45 to 1 and I know other people tweeted me and they got close to 100 to 1 with Skybet. Um, obviously, you take the prices that you can get, but it was brilliant all round. Um, and betting aside, it was just brilliant to see the fact that I thought that these two would be the best stairs. So many people were knocking Brave Man's game all the way around. He's a flat track bully. He's this, he's that. He's not on the level of Group 1. He obviously proved it in the King George and he came in with the best piece of form. Um, better than Galloping Deschamps. I know he won the Irish Gold Cup. Um, and he won an absolute, and he ran an absolute blinder. But obviously, people aren't just interested in him; they want to know about everyone. So, Aplutard, considering how well the stable ran all week, um, he wasn't really put in the race. It reminded me exactly the same as the Betfair. He was stuck in behind. He, he jumped averagely. Um, obviously, on the first circuit, Galpin Deschamps wasn't jumping great, and he was still jumping better than Aplutard. Like I've seen Apple Tards now priced up at four to one for Aintree. Like you've got to be a pretty forgiving person to, to to take that sort of price, considering since winning the Gold Cup in absolute mesmerising performance, flopped completely in the Betfair Chase, then wasn't seen at Christmas due to a late uh, late issue, and then has flopped again here. I mean, I'd understand if the horse had ran say three quarters of the race, and then they just thought, oh, he's not going so well, but. He wasn't really going from the off, so he wouldn't be on my radar. If he want, if he wins between now and the end of the season, I'll just take it on the chin. Um, whereas a polar opposite would be a Hoy Senor. Like he was running a blinder. Um, his jumping was together, but as usual, he's been known, renowned for taking a chance at one, and that's exactly what he did. He took a chance at one and he fell, but arguably, apart from that, he was he was a bit like his entry performance, out in front, bowling along, loving life, jumping. He wasn't getting heavily um, pestered. And, and he was enjoying himself. 
Do I think he would win the finish? No, not with the first two, obviously, especially on collateral form with Brave Man's game. But I do think that he would have led them perfectly. Obviously, he did lead them perfectly into a very strongly ridden Gold Cup. Like People are talking about this being the best Gold Cup since the Quarto Star days because it was strongly ridden from the off with a Hoy Senor. There was, there was no hiding places. And then once he went down, obviously, it was took over by um, Hewitt. And then Hewitt kept it strongly ridden. And it was a brilliant race to, to basically just any sort of chinks in any armors, they were going to be exploited. So Ahoy Senor obviously is going to go to Aintree, probably run in, I'd imagine, the bowl, same as last year. Um, but uh, in fact, actually, no, he was in the novice race last year. I think it's the bowl he'll be in. I think the bowl's the three miles um, this year. Um, so he's one to have on your radar. It's just, again, how much do you... People will say, oh, well, he didn't get in the heat of the battle, um, so he'll be fine, but you've still got to come back from a fall. So he's just one to have on your radar. I'd rather back him over Apu Tard, put it that way, especially with his good record at Aintree. Um, Hewitt ran a brilliant race. Uh, it's gutting for connections that he fell because he's probably booked to finish in around the, between third and fifth. Um, brilliant race, much better than I thought. Um, and you can't really knock connections. Um, Sounds Russian obviously brought down. You know the score with El Dorado and Royal Pagel. Protector I've never really rated. Um, Noble Yates, as I said, is a Grand National horse. He's not at this level. I mean, obviously, people say, oh, you say that now. But I did say this before. Like, he stayed on well in the Gold Cup trial at Cheltenham because he's looking for that longer, that further trip. I understand he did win at shorter trips at three miles at Aintree and stuff, but he's meeting far inferior um, opposition. Don't get me wrong, fourth in a Gold Cup is still absolutely brilliant form. And it would still win you plenty of races over three miles in Ireland and England. But um, I think he's a Grand National horse. Can he win the Grand National this year? I think it'd be an absolute monumental performance if he was managed to do that. Consider he won it off last year. Obviously, he was an absolute handicap plot last year when he won it. And he won it off one four seven, And he's going to go into this race off £20 higher. He's going to be top weight on one six seven. So I don't see it at all. Um, uh, conflated, brilliant race. Very strange with the whole jockey booking switch to Sam Ewing. I mean, that's not going to do the horse or jockey any favours, switching to such an inexperienced jockey about 15 minutes before the race started. It was strange they didn't use a more experienced jockey, even though they hadn't ridden the horse, but still rode a brilliant race, just bumped into two horses that are better. And this is why I think the form is so solid, is the fact that you've got um, the three uh, three Group 1 winners um, from this season, um, all, all at the front all at the front end of the market. Um, and... I say Group One winners obviously Protector at one the um uh Betfair Chase didn't he what's Protector at one yeah Protector at one the Betfair Chase so but basically they're three big horses um talking horses at the start I've only just seen the price completed end up going off at twenty two to one massive drifter on the day um and then obviously Brave Man's game and Galloping Day Shops like this whole Brave Man's game not staying was just madness I didn't even want to get involved because obviously I was having a bit of a celebration anyway. But like I, I really don't understand how you can say a horse didn't stay. Like you could say he's outstayed by Galloping Day Champs, but that's because obviously he's a better horse. He had more energy in reserve, and he came in. He came into that race. Galloping Day Champs looked like he'd been dropped in at the third, third, uh, third from home. He was phenomenal. Um, Brave Man's game. You could say if you take Galloping Day Champs out, Brave Man's game is won by seven lengths. And if obviously if you took Gallop and Deschamps out, then Brave Man's game may not have even had to be hard pushed. What jump in the last? He may have come off. He may have finished with still not even using the whip. It was only because obviously Gallop and Deschamps come up to him and they had like look at you look at Paul Nichols to see how happy he is with that run, and that tells you how good this horse is and how good he thinks. And Paul Paul Nichols loves these type. He's been waiting for a horse like this to have a horse that can compete at this sort of level. He's still only an eight year old, so probably got a good two, three, four years in him. Um, I know obviously most will say your peak is um, around this sort of age, like Gallop and Deschamps would be at his peak age, seven, eight. Um, but I still would not be surprised if Nichols is pushing again. My only concern with Brave Man's game, obviously I said straight away, I've backed him for the King George at 72, um, is if Nichols goes too ambitious. Like last year, he was hell-bent that the King George was the be-all and end-all. So he went to Haydock for the Charlie Hall, and not Haydock, uh, it Weatherby basically he went for the Charlie Hall um and then that is that yeah Weatherby he went for the Charlie Hall chase which was a nice easy prep for him despite having a, a Hoy Senor in the field and then he went to the Gold Cup uh then he went to King George he took that and then had a three-month break and went to the Gold Cup 
So he said he was going to go for the same originally straight after the race. But then since then, he's mentioned about the fact that depending on the ground, he might go for the Betfair chase. My concern with this is the Betfair Haydock is just a horrible track all around. Like it's always softer than it looks. It's heavy, it's tacky, and it takes it out of races. And he's done this a few times where with horses like uh, Clanders Obo, who's been brilliant in the King George, and then tried to take that extra race in, in the Betfair chase and then not done as well in the King George. And it happened as well with Grinitine this year. Tried to have him a bit more ready. He was a bit more ready for the Holden Gold Cup. Bolted up there, one of his career best. And then I think that took it off him for the Tingle Creek and he wasn't at his best. So that would be my concern. I I would really just want to see him go to Weatherby. He'll get fairly good ground, then have a couple of months off and then go King George and then go here again. There's nothing to say galloping Deschamps. There might not be an issue with him or something on the way. Um, whereas if you can get your horse there, you wouldn't want to have tarnished it by going to the bet fair. But these are just my selfish opinions. Um, anyway, Brave Man's Game is the brilliant horse that we all hoped that he would be. And he's done us no disservice all year. Anyone who's followed me all year, we've been Brave Man's Game has been one of the biggest bets um, throughout the season. Like obviously the Charlie Hall when he was uh, two to one against a Hoy Senor. Then at Christmas, six to one anti post, but um, you could get three to one on the day because of Lahon Press. The confidence didn't waver, and we took that one in. And then Brave Man's game, I said that I didn't think he'd beat Galloping Day Champs, but he was the only one I wanted on side. And here we are, he's brilliant again. So we know his route, you know he's going King George, and you know he's going Gold Cup. As I said, the only concern is if he goes to the Betfair Chase. If the Betfair Chase was on like quick ground, then yeah, that's no concern, but it just never is, never is. Um, Galloping Deschamps, what can you say? Like he is the Constitution Hill of the chasing world. People are like, oh yeah, Constitution Hill will go th- could go three mile Gold Cup next year and take it. Like I'm not buying that, not with his experience. Um, Galloping Deschamps just looked an absolute freak. He looked like one out of the top draw. It's amazing to think I was doing the review the other day and I was looking back and two years ago, I had him at 25 to one to win any race. And he was sent off eight to one to win the Martin Pipe. And then obviously you look at him now and he's getting sent off seven to five to win a gold cup. And he pretty much wins it on the bridle. Like This is a monumental training performance from Willie Mullins. The fact that this time last year, everyone was complaining, why is he not going to Brown Advisory when he fell? And he was keen jumping and stuff. And he got the job done, but he was very exuberant in his jumping department. And they've just knocked the gas out of him. And I was slightly worried that have they done it too much? Especially on the first circuit, I thought he was not sluggish, but he just wasn't really interested. And he's been nursed in, and that was some ride from Paul Townend to bring him through. Absolute balls of steel. And yeah, brilliant horse. I think he's going to take all the beating probably for... Willie Mullins took ages to win this race. And then obviously he's done it with Al Boom Photo um, two two years in a row. And now he's got this horse. So now he's won, I don't know what, three in about the last five, six renewals. Um, and he was a creature of habit. So he will go for the same, very similar sort of prep. Um, and line him up in very set, probably the exact same races as what he's won this year, and he'll go back to the Gold Cup once more. And I think he will take all the beating. I think everyone who's worried about, oh, but what about after the Gold Cup? A lot of horses don't go on from there after such a grueling race. Whilst this was a grueling race from the perspective of the fact they went straight off it from the off with a Hoy Senor, Hammer and Tong, big, strong pace. Um, the ground was like perfect for a gold cup. Like this wasn't like the days of like native river when they're like slogging it out in the really deep, heavy mud. This was perfect. And yeah, it's going to take an awful lot out of the horse, but he's got it on a decent surface. So he's got no real reason by the fact that obviously it will have exerted a lot of energy and put him through. And you don't know how much he had left. Like he, okay, he was pushed out to win, but does he still have another 5% in him that he could have gone to, which means that he hasn't had to push all the way there obviously we don't know um so for me the reason i said take the price well the reason i took the price on the day at three to one was because you either take the price then and if he doesn't go on from here then it is what it is or if he does run at punchestown and he runs in a three or four run a field and he's sent off like one to eight and he and even if he's a class above him so he wins anyway like then his price will get chopped. Then you'll have six months through the winter, he'll come back and he'll do the similar again. Um, and then suddenly you're looking at come the Dumbledore Racing Festival, Irish Gold Cup sort of time. He could be like a four to six shot or something like that, a four to seven shot. Um, and, and what do you know? You still don't know if he's going to have that. Because Galloping Deschamps, that was the first proper race he's had over fences. Like even what he did to Bob Ollinger, that wasn't the same with horse as what we were used to in the past. Um, 
he still didn't have a proper, proper race. This was the first time he came off the bridle and said, yeah, here I am. I know he did it at the Dublin Racing Festival, but I almost feel like that was by design. I think Townham rode him to have that almost as a, as impossible as, as he could. And he still won and obviously they could barely pull him up. I think because his horse has got such, it's got good mentality. He's now very settled. He's a solid jumper. He switches off completely. Very strong stayer at the end of his race. And he's only seven years old. I'll be very disappointed if you don't see him going on from this. If he doesn't race the rest of this season, that's no big issue. Um, and if you see him at Punchers Town, I'll be disappointed if he if he's not backing up there. Uh, Fox Hunters, I'm not really going to go into at all. I mean, it's a great story as always. It often is when you think Borsele travel well. I think the trainer tried to be a little bit too confident by only entering one of his three best horses and also only having one run from Christmas to now. Um, and it's maybe paid the cost, travelled well, jumped well, just didn't find like when the when the taps got turned on, didn't have it there. And obviously, as usual with this race, when the favourite doesn't go close, 66 to 1, 28 to 1, 50 to 1, 11 to 1, first four in the market. So on to the mayor's chase. And I couldn't have summed this up better the night before, personally. I thought, I think my words were that depending on the type of punter, depends on which direction you were going to go. Obviously, we had Impervious at 28 to 1 and Allegoria de Vassi at 8 to 1. So for us, either way, as long as one of those two won, it, that was the, the perfect scenario. I couldn't see any other horse in, in the race winning. The difference was, did you want to go with the sexy, flashy, potentially could be superstar horse in Allegoria de Vassi, or did you want to go with the the horse that was tailor-made for this race in the fact that she's come along, she's beaten the boys, she's beaten the boys, giving them the weight allowance back. So she gave a pound to the field. Um, she's got plenty of experience. And the biggest thing was the fact that she finds off the bridle. Um, and that was based, that was basically it. The reason I thought that she, she, the f- whole finding off the bridle was the fact that you look at last two winners, Cole Reeve and LMA, they've both needed to have a full on battle in order to get up. And that's what happened here. Don't get me wrong, when Allegoria de Vassi came up to Impervious, I thought Allegoria de Vassi is going to win and go on from this. This race didn't pan out. The result was pretty similar to how I thought it would be, but it didn't pan out the way I thought it would be because Allegoria de Vassi jumped straight at every fence. That was clearly, Mullins said it's not an issue and it, and it wasn't an issue. She, at no point were you worried if you were on her as a backer that she was going to fall. And when she loomed up next to Impervious, you thought, OK, she'll probably kick on and go on from here but impervious is just a gritty little mare and she was just like absolutely not this is mine for the win and obviously brilliant for everyone who followed at 28 to 1 because it's a lot bigger than obviously 8 to 1 and the 8 to 1 was at the start of the season so many people will have missed that um but at the same time it's going to be interesting to see how these two are campaigned going forward um obviously impervious a jp mcmanus horse LMA obviously isn't going to be in the feature for this. So I would not be surprised if she was to line up in this again next year. Like I think she's currently about seven to two. And if you like a short one, that might not end up being the worst of prices. Again, you'd want to see her go, not go into Punchers Town, in my opinion, just because I think she's had plenty of racing. Whereas Allegory de Vassi, I think she could take another race because that was only her third run. I think Impervious, that's probably uh, this. If she has another race, I think it'd be a sixth run. Uh, one, two, three, four. No, be our fifth run. Um, but we'll we'll see. So, but yeah, those two are very good mares. Um, they could step up into. I mean, unfortunately for them, this year of all years, they probably could have gone to something like the Turners or Brown Advisory and been bang there with their weight allowance. Um, just because both of those two kind of were won by a jockey with a great ride from the front, it's hard to see that neither of those two wouldn't have been in the places in either one of those, providing they suit the trip. Impervious has thrown up a 159 RPR. So with her weight allowance, I'm sure she would have been bang there if she was to run in the Turners. Um, but it, it is what it is. They've got, at the end of the day, just notes, shows you to note, JP McManus is buying these horses and he knows exactly what he's buying. Yeah, he's probably paying massive amounts for them. But Impervious, obviously we backed Impervious before she beat Dino Blue. Impervious beat Dino Blue. And obviously JP thought, I really like Dino or Dino Blue, who was sent off Mare's Novice Hurdle favourite the year before. And they were like, right, I'm having Impervious. They've obviously come in for her, kept him with the same trainer, same jockey, which is absolutely brilliant to see, but it just shows another Cheltenham Festival winner. And, and they know exactly where they're putting their money. So on to the final race of the festival, the Martin Pipe. 
handicap hurdle. And yet again, we go out with a winner of the Martin Pipe, which has been brilliant for me for the last few years. Not just a winner, but we had the one too. We had Irocco and No Ordinary Joe. JP McManus double up. No Ordinary Joe went from, I think it was about 20, 20 or 25 to 1 we got, and it went off 14 to 1. Irocco was about 8 to 1, went off 6 to 1. Um, I think Irocco is a very promising horse going forwards. Um, the way he was ridden along, but was finding it almost running in snatches. Um, and considering in the past, it's only, I think, it only had it two runs over hurdles for, uh, yeah, two runs over hurdles for Oliver Greenall um, since coming there. And both of those two were on the snap, just on the bridle and then winning going away. So to win in an, a proper battle, but we're still like three, three, four lengths down coming up to the last, coming to the last. And then I wasn't sure was the horse going to get up, but just stayed on really well all the way to the line. Um, the problem is, because it's a JP McManus horse, he has to line all his ducks up to work out who's going where. But for me, this looks like a good horse for the if they wanted to go over fences and obviously stay with that trainer. I don't know too much about him, to be honest. Oliver Greeno and Josh Guerrero. Um, but they can obviously train a Cheltenham winner because they have here. So um, whilst this was a handicap, so it would be lower than what the likes of, like say, a stay away Faye would have achieved. Um, in fact, I'll just have a look. That's a one four three. And uh, stay away Faye achieved uh one five two. Yeah, so it's about nine pounds below what the Albert Bartlett um would have achieved. Um but there's nothing to say that with fences that this horse can't improve further and could end up being a stay for the stay for the future in something like the Brown Advisory. Another one that's twenty to one currently. It was just the way he just found more and rallied when looking beat to go past both No Ordinary Joe and Buddy One. Um and I think you've got to keep the horse in your tracker. Um, this race has been brilliant in the last few years. I didn't have Banbridge, but I had Gallop in Deschamps obviously the year before. So it was in this race I was mentioning. Eight to one Gallop in Deschamps was. <sighs> Never going to see that price again in your life. Um, let's see what what was he running off as well. He was running off that day. He was running off one four two. Jesus, one four two. So he's running off 142 and he's now rated 180 over hurdles. Let's just say he was well in. So yeah, and that's the Martin Pipe. So it was another brilliant um, festival. The one to take out of that is Iroco. I'd take for the potentially Brown Advisory 20 to 1. Again, just keep it on your radar. Wait for news. Oh, this, this or that. Um, and then No Ordinary Joe. Like I've got a feeling that this one was being lined up for a handicap. I backed it for a handicap earlier in the week. And I didn't see that it had been entered into this one until later in the week um, when I did the, looked at it the night before. Um, this horse still looks handicapped well in to see what he's got put up at 139. Only gone up £4 for that run. Um, so get a claimer on and we'll see. Um, but still would have its chances. I know throughout the, all, all four of the days, uh, a lot of the focus of the market have either been the selections that I've put up or the selections... Um, say in the first like seven or eight or if a couple of eye catchers but they're fairly obvious ones but otherwise if I start going through like the 10th place horse we could go well in this handicap in the future then we would be here all day and you'd be getting two hour previews so I put all of those into my notebook and then when they come up whether it's an entry festival punches down I'll look at those horses specifically but I obviously I put my selections up anyway um Going forward, the only video left is the Cheltenham uh, review video. So I'm going to review my last three years of the Cheltenham Festival. And I'm also going to review each selection I've placed this year. Um, it is profitable all three years. And obviously this year has been good. Especially considering obviously Thursday was a complete write-off. So in effect, it was trying to make profit out of three days because the Thursday was just a wipeout. Um, going forward, there's going to be a few things going on that uh, people are going to have the option to uh, have a look at um, for towards the Cheltenham 2024 festival, but there'll be more information out about that after entry. Um, but for now, yep, that's everything for Cheltenham um, done. Um, we've only got a couple of weeks till entry, so I mean, me personally, I just I don't even look at the betting markets, the horse racing day to day. I just give my brain a rest, just because come entry time, I want to be fresh, ready to go. I don't want to be worrying about what I've won or lost a few days ago. So my advice would be just lock your account, have a break, go out for the weekend, go and enjoy yourself if you want a few quid. Obviously, these are these are the uh, boys from the last few years that I've done well on and that they're uh, some of my favourites. Obviously, Tiger Roll, Grand National, Shishkin and the Arkle. And obviously, last well, two weeks ago, last Friday's Gold Cup. 
So anyway, enough of me. Uh, I am Risk for Rewards, and thank you for listening, and I hope you all had a good Cheltenham Festival. Goodbye.